and welcome to Varm Blog. And today we're talking to Jared of Cyber Dandy. And um, we are also going to be speaking largely on existentialism and a little bit on existentialism, anarchism and existentialism and leftism and maybe implications for the post Biden left. Um, but let's start off with the obvious question in the room. Um, since existentialism is generally the the uh, modernist de jure philosophy that if you're a high schooler, frankly, you encounter first. Um, there seems to be a complicated context to the fact that it becomes pretty unpopular pretty quickly. So why, why do you think existentialism, both in its historical array and in most people's encounter with it, gets dropped off as a kind of radical analysis? So uh, to begin with, I think you're right. It is, you know, at least if you're talking about Nietzsche, Mm -hmm. existential it, it is basically the first doorway in a philosophy uh people wind up going through but it's the entire history if we're going to look at kierkegaard forward is never quite comfortable with a lot of uh philosophy on the left and some of that is the way that existentialists respond to hegel kierkegaard or sterner mm -hmm. um, the other one is just um, it doesn't sit right with the objectivity uh, framework that a lot of Marxists and leftists want to uh, base their philosophy on. So you have a philosophy that's uncomfortable to begin with. And then when it starts becoming politically applied in France, by Sartre and Simone de Beauvoir and the circle around uh, modern times. Um, they never really uh, become close friends with the Communist Party. They actually were attacked pretty systematically by the PCF. Which is kind of ironic given that we always think of Sartre as you know, breaking with Camus over defending the communist. And then it seems that almost immediately the, the French communist party uh, declared them like personas non grata theoretically pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, and even that, even that breakup with Camus is not very well understood by a lot of people. Um, what happened is a report came out in France about uh, the, uh, the, work camps in mm -hmm. Russia and uh, no one quite knew what to do about that information. Um, they were pretty, Sartre and Camus were both uh, on the side of working class struggle one way or another and had mostly been comfortable with the communist party and what was going on in Russia. Um, but when that information came out, basically Sartre said, okay, let's not, not feed into the capitalist propaganda that's going to be a result of, of uh, that report. And Camus said, no, we have to publish about this immediately and we have to condemn it. And that was, that was the argument. So neither of them thought the camps were a good idea or even thought they were necessary. Um, it was, uh, it was about how to handle the information publicly. So you also kind of blame the structuralist turn for a decline in um, interest in existentialism. Would you like to go into that a little bit? Yeah. So existentialism really came to dominate France for the whole post-war period up until basically 1968, uh, where... Uh, a lot of what the left thought was possible was suddenly um, shown to be incorrect. And students and workers came together and, you know, had a little rebellion. Mm -hmm. uh, but after that point, it was, you know, there's, there's already a loss of confidence in the Communist Party in France after... Uh, after Hungary and a lot of 
a lot of the French intellectuals started condemning Stalinism after that. But the structuralists and the post-structuralists um, felt sort of like they needed to understand history in a different way that didn't come out of uh, class analysis. So that's where you get stuff like Foucault, who's trying to understand like changes in the fundamental, you know, epistemic truth of uh, society or an analysis right. of power. And along with that, that new way of analysis came a rejection of the idea of the subject and a rejection of enlightenment humanism. And those were both points on which uh, the new French intellectuals tried to distance themselves from existentialism and uh, and attack attack Sartre. Uh, right. A lot of those attacks were not uh, not well read. Um, they were misunderstandings a lot of the time and. But uh, I think a big part of it was they just needed to free the air up of the great dominance of the French intellectual. Right. So you basically, what, as Pierre Badu would, would say, uh, one group of intellectual social capital terrorists took out another group of intellectual social capital terrorists, um, which, which is one cynical way to look at it. Uh, another mm -hmm. more interesting way is that um, the you know there there is a political motivation behind like behind the break with existentialism in in terms of the humanism anti humanism debates and what I find interesting about this is when you hear the humanist anti humanist debates reframed in Marxism now no one even mentions the existentialists even though. Like when you think about the the university context of like Althusser and and whatnot, how can you not like? And yet it makes it seem like the issue is either Khrushchev or it's like the Frankfurt School, um, or it's Gramsci who you know who who does have a lot of overlaps with the existentialist Marxist, but um, it's not. Like, it is interesting that even in our recounting of this debate, we don't even re really recount that the debates, that the humanist debates are actually kind of squarely aimed at existentialism in the context of the French university in specific, right? So, right. Um, and I think some people do this because they don't want to deal with the fact that so much of this, like, Marxism is frankly an academic debate almost completely with 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 occasional like four ways to the french communist party but i mean althusser has his problems with that too later on so it's not like structuralism and post-structuralism get the the okay and by the time you get to foucault you're not like no one thinks they're really marxist anymore um yeah well go ahead so so i you know my althusser knowledge is not uh very well developed but what I, I definitely understand the post-structuralist arguments more and okay. I've read a lot more of that work. And so um, the, the way that they critique existentialists uh, for humanism is based on a misunderstanding of what Sartre actually thought about humanism, mm -hmm. which he had a whole handful of uh, types that he wrote about uh, most popularly in Nausea. Uh, where he condemned various types of humanism, but he thought of his own philosophy as something like a humanism, but not based on any kind of notion of the self or the subject, which he right. rejects. And yeah, there's no there's no meaningful inherent subject, even if there's like something like a biological being that's not the same as a, as a subjectivity at all. And so existence thus comes before essence right right uh, and that's um, the other thing a lot of the post so not only are the post structuralists sort of like attacking a straw man mm -hmm. but a lot of what they actually are saying can be found in sart and then you see this with the sit situationist international as well i mean they're called that based on sartre's concept of the situation it's not uh it, 
just a random term they picked. Yeah, I, I actually wanted to uh, to ask you a little bit more about that because because of the situation as like weird relationship to both like proto autonomia and and left communism that we forget it's specifically French context. Um, yeah. and thus, and thus we forget its specific relationship to existentialism, what hence in which the name, um, and, and, and again, like we said in the beginning, this always strikes me as odd because of the European philosophies that are tied to Marxism that you're gonna encounter, the French existentialists are the first ones you do. I mean, like the, only, the they're literally the only Marxists that I know anyone who read anything about in high school, like other than maybe someone who read the manifesto directly for a class once. Like, yeah. well, and well, and then there's also another, if we're, if you're going to talk about Americans, you know, yeah, we'll get back trans- to that, but, yeah. Yeah. but yes. Yeah. Go ahead. But, but maybe say, finish your current statement. I just want to circle around our, our understanding of this comes through what? Well, well, through like decades old source material, you know, mm-hmm. uh, most of the work that Sartre wrote on Marxism was published in like the late 60s was the first volume of the critique of dialectical reason the second volume wasn't published in english until the 90s right and so and then the academic secondary literature on both those works is like you could you could read all of it in a week well you know what's funny about that i mean to be fair to like the post structuralist um in their heyday too right in 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 the heyday of like foucault dominating you know english history departments etc and and to some degree foucault studies still do um yeah um although i feel like sometimes people read foucault to build the better panopticon but that's a whole different rant um the it was surprising how little foucault was translated into english when i was actually studying this in the heyday of Foucault of Foucaultian new historicism. So like we are still waiting on volume four of the history of sex or volume the, the Christian volume of the history of sexuality. Right. Yeah. Um it's like a, a month or two away, but yeah. Yeah. Um we didn't have the lectures de France, which are super important, completely translated until I was in my 30s. Like and yet we had a burgeoning Foucault industry like when I was in high school. So there is an interesting way in which like a lot of these European in- intellectuals for languages that are commonly spoken and have we have readily ready access to. This is a confusing thing because not like mm-hmm. it's hard to find people who can translate French. Right. I mean, like right. French is a, like French is a highly context specific language that leads to a lot of weird translations in English. Totally true. But it's not like there's not plenty of French speakers. It's taught in most high schools in the United States. So, like, like, why do we have so little of this work, do you think? I don't know. It's some of it also has to be. I don't honestly, I just don't know, because even Foucault, uh mm-hmm. His one of his first published works was a long introduction to this existential psychoanalyst called Ludwig Binswanger. Mm-hmm. And uh, the book is called Dream and Existence. This is like, you know, Foucault's analysis of phenomenology is that work. Uh, there is going to be some unpublished uh, stuff coming out that he wrote, uh, they found in his notes, but. There's a direct connection between existentialism flowing right into the uh, post-structuralist theory that mm-hmm. for whatever reason, uh, the academics that are researching this stuff just are allergic to it. Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating because, like, I literally used to, see, you know, back before my Marxist days, even when I was a conservative, I could just pull out tons and reams and reams and reams of secondary material in this stuff. And yet key parts of it are not translated and also under discussed in the secondary literature, too. So it's like I always feel like I'm getting an incomplete version. So it's one of the things where, like, you know, you might not know this, Jared. My bet nar is all too sair. Like I'm at, I'm in an internal like crusade against all too sair that everyone knows about. Um, oh, but 
but I'm always finding that my understanding of Altusera is somewhat limited by the fact that a lot of it actually is poorly translated, and the people who who I respected who were critiquing Altusera are actually critiquing sort of um, English you know, um, English receptions of him in the seventies that may not be entirely accurate to what he actually thought. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this seems like an academic problem, except that a lot of people who are not academics now, um, for both good and ill, this being confined to, to critical theory departments and, and subsets of the English department or history mm -hmm. department have, have broken open in the last decade and a half. Like, the stuff that I was studying in college became Twitter speak um, for good and ill, you know? Um, so in, in some sense, like, you know, you can go to a Barnes and Nobles anywhere in the country and go get a Foucault book um, or a Sartre book still to this day. And then, like I said, Sartre is one of these Sartre and Camus are one of these um, philosophers that you often read in high school and are often mm -hmm. embarrassed that you did. Like, this is another thing that I I can describe my own cycle with this, where I have only come out recently and been like, no, I, you know, I was obsessed with Camus when I was in ninth grade. Before I even knew how to say his name was Camus. Like, I would sure, call him Camus. Like, so, but what was your introduction to Camus? The literature, actually, it's not the literature. not the philosophy. Right. Right. Like, and I think this plays into a lot of the misinterpretation of French uh well, existentialism specifically mm -hmm. because they were so damn literate. They, the plays and the novels that they were writing, all of them. Well, I don't know about Merleau Ponty, but right. that, that is how a lot of Americans came to understand what existentialism is. And as a, as a series of literary tropes, it doesn't really uh, give you the background that's like rooted in Hegel and Husserl and just like this really complicated uh, systematic analysis of what experience is like. Uh, so, yeah. So, so yes, people are embarrassed to read the stranger, you know, it's like right up there with 1984 and animal right. farm. And yeah, all those books that you were assigned in high school. I mean, and yeah. Um, and yet, um, and I also remember reading, uh, say, The Rebel or um, The Myth of Syphysis without additional context. And without a lot of context, frankly, particularly in The Rebel, you can read Camus as sounding like Jordan Peterson, which yeah. is which is wild because that's not what even at the time, even at his most, quote, conservative, he was not he was not heading in that direction. But that's what it sounds like without context. Well, there's, it's funny you say that because Jordan Peterson is one of the very few people on YouTube who I have seen even talk about existential psychoanalysis. He has like mm -hmm. five lectures or something on it. They're terrible. They don't, they don't uh, actually discuss what Midard Boss or uh, uh, Sartre or uh, Dinswanger were really saying, but I for being a Jungian, he is definitely uh, dove into the existentialist waters pretty deeply. And I think that could be what you're even picking up on. I mean, there is definitely influence there. The whole humanistic psychology movement is deeply influenced by existentialism, period. So th this is a good pivot. And we'll come back to situation and then we'll come back to America, but there's just so much stuff coming out of this. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you is the humanistic psychology movement has kind of interesting fallen out of favor with both. Um, how do I say this nicely? Um, the way in which old forms of psychology are used by English departments as kind of an elephant graveyard for psychological theories. So, like, you know, when you want to go to die, you go and get applied to novels. Um, but, you know, hence, hence the, but this also keeps things like psychoanalysis, particularly classical and Lacanian psychoanalysis, sort of alive beyond their somewhat limited clinical use. 
Um, this is not to say that there's no clinical use for classical or Lacanian psychoanalysis. I don't want to like make those statements. That's clearly not true, but that there's not that much. Whereas humanistic psychology hasn't suffered that fate, but it also does not seem to have been picked up the way positivistic psychology or some of the more optimistic forms of uh, cognitive behavior uh uh, behavioral therapy and whatnot have been picked up in the United States. Why do you think that is? And does it have political implications? Well, a big part of it is uh, exactly the experimental uh, usefulness of uh, CBT. Um, humanistic psychology, part of it, it uh, and positive psychology, they share the same ancestors like Abraham Maslow and hierarchy of human needs and his later work is all about how to reach like peak human experiences which leads all into the flow garbage mm -hmm. basically that you see and the positive psychology movement so uh it's alive still in that way so there but anyway cbt you could test it uh it's uh modular it's programs are you know studied like uh statistically for results talk therapy in general has not necessarily been uh favored statistically for its successes yeah the other thing to say, it, it doesn't have a lot of what we would consider um statistical evidence for any kind of efficacy although to be fair neither has a lot of other psychology when they try to retest it so right or even psychiatry right and that's, um, a, that's a disturbing thing but yes <laughs> but then the other thing i think is how useful has uh whatever form of psychology been to the business environment to the corporation and to human resources and those kind of applied uh settings so industrial psychology organizational psychology and that's where you start seeing uh i think a reinforcement of uh, certain biases in in the field because mm -hmm. yes. really what they don't okay. want uh you know if you're a business you're really not trying to solve your employees deep uh existential problems mm -hmm. you're trying to you know make sure that they they're better uh, scientifically managed workers. And yeah, I mean, yeah, they would have very little interest in actually solving the deeper problems because it might actually demotivate them to continue the rat race in such a way. Um, yeah. So this is this is interesting. Um, get to to your politics, though. I mean, you're obviously very influenced by humanistic psychology. You're very influenced by existentialism. You consider yourself kind of a, in the anarchist socialist spectrum, right? Um, you know, I'll I let am, you define yourself yeah. there, but. Yeah, I'm very, very long-term committed anarchist. Uh, but I've always, my introduction and my ongoing interest in anarchist, anarchism is more tied to like post-World War II British anarchism like uh, Herbert Reed or Colin Ward than it is to, uh, or like Paul Goodman in the United States, than it is to like Bookchin or uh, even Stirner or, you know, any of the really popular anarchists with mm -hmm. anarchists. I have not gotten a lot out of them. And this is this is going to come up later when we talk about some other things. But Colin Ward is kind of like my hero. So I know Colin Ward from a long history in anarchism that I actually think is quite good. Um, and that's really my exposure to Colin Ward. But it's it's interesting when you contrast that to like the 90s Bookchin um, Bob Black debates like. Mm -hmm. And then the, the anarchist movement being associated with Occupy, Paracon, uh, kinds of post-Marxism, the anti-globalization movement in the 90s. Um, and then this other set of anarchism that's really associated with primitivism and um, the first group of people who use the term post-left, which is now hard to use because a whole different group of people with no relationship to that group use the same term. 
which I, yeah, um, I have not wrapped my head around that yet. But Yeah, I know. I, I mentioned talking about the, the new post-left Social Democrats once, and you were like, who are they? And I'm like, uh, we have to have a discussion yeah. about how this term has changed. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, and then one group you're leaving out, which has been a big influence locally for mm -hmm. the people I've been working with, is uh, in insurrectionary anarchism that comes out of Italy uh, and is closely related to autonomism and situationist yeah, but, yeah which yeah the, the the insurrectionary anarchism that comes out of italy has a, another reason with, flat, uh, with france and uh i am more familiar in our pre you and i have been long interlocutors on the interwebs um mm -hmm. so people know that there are some some back history here um but i've been long kind of studying and critiquing communization theory which is adjacent to that but not that like right. it's it comes out of on one hand, it comes out of an uh, anarchist discovering Marxist left communism. And in the other hand, it comes out of Marxist left communists discovering insurrectionary anarchism. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that um, was uh, a lot of people are influenced by that. I don't know anymore, but they were like 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this stuff has really faded out of favor in the United States, um, partially because. Uh, after Occupy, people became more interested in more status forms of uh, of Marxism, frankly, you know, and more explicitly status forms of Marxism, um, forms that, you know, um, social democracy, uh, Marxist-Leninism, the, the increasingly capitalist concessionary variants of, of late Maoism, um, which is also very interesting because I've literally seen in my lifetime the 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 dominant subcultural strain of Maoism change to like an almost opposed view, and in a very yeah. short period of time. Like, um, so when I when I was encouraging uh, Jay Paul Malfoy uh, to publish his book on Maoism, um, he was writing about Mark, you know, like third worldism, MLM, Mao Zedong thought. And like at the time that by the time that book got published, everything was moving back to like re, uh, pro China uh, dungest adjacent positions. Whereas all the Maoists that I had known prior to 2015, almost all of them were, they were bigger China critics than I was like by a lot. Um, yeah. And how familiar are you with uh, fr the French Maoists? Like the, uh, I'm division. fairly, I'm fairly familiar with the divisions, although I haven't kept up with them contemporaneously. So my knowledge of them kind of fades around the eighties. Yep. Okay. Me too. But yeah, I, I do think it's interesting that you had that whole, uh, gauche proletariat or what, you know, what it was right. like the left of the left basically who their notion of what Maoism was, was some kind of anti-authoritarian, uh, cultural marx like i don't want to say cultural marxism but a cultural revolution right i and mean then you had althusser yeah you had althusser's like version of it who um which was i mean one of the things about althusser's maoism is actually other than the way he talks about science which does the which if you know stalinist can't you actually know what it's doing um uh, there's not a whole lot of tells like it's actually hard to figure out his his actual relationship to to uh to maoism that's why i've started meeting like altusarian social democrats um which is a wild thing <laughs> to me um and uh, and i also remember the rise in the in the aughts of in in, in the cliffite spear of trotskyism the altusarian trotskyist which was also a wild development that i couldn't understand i was like but these two things are not like the other. They literally contradict each other on fundamental things. Um, uh, so, so yeah, it's it's. Uh, I think this is all. This this is interesting because it shows how given to like weird, so, basically social fads that a lot of this stuff mm -hmm. is is subjected to. Um, so you've been trying to resurrect existentialism as a serious left um let's say rubric um of a way to to at least interpret uh left 
left action. Um, I, I can't say that it's caught on. Um, no. But <laughs> um, why do you? And, why been, do and you, it's been 10 years. I mean, this yeah. is not a new project at all. No, no, no. I, I've known you being the exis, you know, the existential kiss in some form or another for about a decade. But um, I think our, our dialogue at least goes back to what, 2012 or something. So it's, uh, why do you think it is not, why, despite the interest in existentialism, which I don't think has gone away, like I still find popular introductions to existentialism that are like mm -hmm. decent sellers on, on uh, whatever, like um, uh, you go into Amazon, you can find them. Um, yet it seems like it's, it's treated as pop philosophy, not yes. as anything that has anything to say about politics now. Um, and it's yeah. often kind of associated almost with like the more sophisticated version of, I don't know, something stupid like objectivism, like, you know, Andrani and objectivism or something like, because of a couple of premises in the beginning that seem similar metaphysically, like there is no, you know, imposed non-biological essence, et cetera, and so forth. But like, that's about it. Um, mm -hmm. Why do you think it is, despite its continued popularity, totally depoliticized? Well, the beat culture is part of that, right? Uh, oh, yeah, I wasn't expecting the, that. Go into that more. <laughs> well, you know, a lot of the uh, people who were initially fans in the English speaking world of existentialism were part of the you know, the beatnik and then hippie culture. And it, it gained that coffee house moodiness. I mean, a lot of people might call that goth now, but back then it was, you were reading being in nothingness. And that, that was like kind of your, your cultural persona. Yeah. And, and because of superficial words like emptiness, equating it to Buddhism and other weird, oh. complete misreadings of both, philosophies but yeah. um but I, it's uh, the cultural it's the way that it became such a cultural item in the 60s that also allows it to be in hindsight viewed as a passing moment of, of the history of just uh, consumer culture so uh, but that's not true in the arab world i mean there's other places we could talk about existentialism the arab yeah, world so wasn't what where do you think it's gone? So you think it's really dominant in the in the Arab world? I can tell you just a, just as a as a, an, an anecdote to back up what I think you're about to say. I found tons of that stuff translated in into Arabic um, from English and French when I was in Cairo. So yeah, yep, it was huge. Uh, and Sartre fucked it up by uh, supporting Israel. That's what happened the second that Sartre came out and. Uh, was favorable towards Israel during a during a time when he was trying to have a conversation both with uh, I think some people in Egypt and uh, yeah they they started burning his books and they were really they were really let down by that yeah and, e course, and yeah. Egypt coming out as a Zionist isn't going to go well no <laughs> yeah yeah so that unfortunately that has had a lasting impact and also you know just the whole uh, zeitgeist of the Arab world is different than it was in the 60s. I mean, it's not as socialist or as, you know. Yeah, pan, pan Arabism has largely collapsed and, and uh, Saudi oil money has funded resurgences in different variant forms of Salafi and Wahhabi. More, more Salafi, I mean, Wahhabism is kind of specific to Saudi Arabia, but. Um, and if people don't know enough about Islam to know about what Salafi is, it, it, it's to say it's fundamentalism is actually not correct. Um, but it is a more, uh, Islam as a way of life and law. Um, yeah. and there are various degrees of it. Like there, there are Salafists that I met, uh, in Cairo who I actually say would be pretty modern. Um, maybe the equivalent for for people in the United States would be like modern Orthodox Jews, which I guess also is not going to help a lot of people. But 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 yes, I mean, uh, but, but I say modern Orthodox as opposed to Hasidim uh, okay. Maharadi, and um, and so 
modernist Islam, which was super liberal, has kind of fallen out of favor. But also what's interesting is the Islam of North Africa in specific was always kind of liberal. Um, mm -hmm. And and there is actually kind of a tension between Salafist and 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 like uh, and like Egyptian Algerian traditionalists um, uh, in the area because like Sufi saints and all that stuff is a, a big deal in North Africa and Salafists don't want any of that. Um, okay. So that tension's I know this seems off of existentialism, but that tension is really there. But it also still existentialism still has a rebellious edge, and so edu and when you meet educated Egyptians, they often are conversant in it now. Like it's well, still a thing. So, yeah, and from what I read, I mean, it was you know, the second largest uh, following of existentialism was in the Arab world. It was not you know second to France. It was not in other European countries. Which is right. interesting because half of existentialism comes out of Germany with Karl Jaspers and Heidegger and Yeah. Yeah. I mean it, but but the what's interesting I think is the German and, and and Scandinavian existentialists are associated with well in Scandinavia they're associated with Christianity and in Germany they were associated with uh, Nazism. Um yeah. so <laughs> Yeah, and then the one, and then the ones that weren't came to America, the Frankfurt School. Or, right, right, like right. Eric Fromm, I, I have never been able to convince myself that he's an existentialist, but the guy wrote, you know, on the same themes. Like, to have and to be is, you know, Sartre has a chapter in being and nothing is called being, having, doing, or something like that. It's like the same thing. And then, you know, Martin Buber and there is a whole like uh, Jewish existentialist school obviously did not hang around in Germany during the Nazis. Uh, yeah. So. Well, you know, um, some people seem to be coming late because they're asking uh, like m most existentialism seems like poetry. And I'm like, well, the critique of dialectical reason is not a poetic text like at all. No. Um and neither would be anything by Monty Parley. Uh, I, I, th I think I think it is sort of the the legacy is dampened in America by the fact that your exposure is through Sartre's literary text. Um, and as we said, that his a lot of his philosophical texts were not completely translated till very late, and right. um, its and association with beat culture. It's associated. I, the other thing we have to talk about the situationists, and maybe this is a good point to come back to that. Um, the situationists are interesting in that they're both an artistic and a political movement, um, explicitly. Mm -hmm. But I think in America, if you're not a 68 fetishist, you associate like my encounters with situationism before I was on the left was in art classes. Right. Wow. Okay. Um, about the history of, of modernists transitioning in the postmodern art, um, and you know a long history there, going back to like even stuff like uh, like the Dada school. Like if you if you know like some of the techniques that the situationists were using to generate slogans and stuff, it was similar to Dadaist art, although it had a very different political valence. Dadaism. Some of those guys became communists, but a lot of them became super reactionary or religious or just didn't survive the war. Right. So um, uh, it's uh, the, the situation is uh, reception in America, though, it does seem to be largely based off of uh, one text, you know, outside yeah. of the art discussions. And that is the society of the spectacle. And that's usually right. read not completely contextualized. So, right. How, do you think that's hurt, like, the understanding of the relationship between existentialism and these other uh, French um, ideological schools? Absolutely. Uh, one of the, I first of all, uh, yeah, the situationists did not, they might have named themselves after that concept in Sartre's writing, but they were not happy about Sartre. They, you know, they did not like the figure of the public intellectual at all. And part of their critique of society was a critique of that position 
so there was that. But uh, a lot of anarchists, um, uh, especially in the post-left anarchist uh, quadrant, are heavily influenced by the situationists. And yeah. uh, just let me pause for other. newbies who don't remember the context of 10, 15 years, 20 years ago. Post left here is Bob Black. Uh, um, I guess some of the proto primitivists, uh, yeah. early, early Sarazen. Who else would really hike him bay, but we don't like to talk about him anymore for obvious reasons. Right. Um, uh, well, the- who, who else would be left? Um, well, you had a big, so you had like basically three main uh, subclasses that were post left. Like you said, the proto primitivist, so Zerzan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then there's always been a green anarchist, non primitivist, um, and sometimes oriented towards indigenous struggle part of it. Mm-hmm. And then you had the Bob Black. Uh, more like punk rock nihilist part of it. Who and, will, who who has called me a Stalinist for saying that uh, there were hierarchies in in hunter gatherer societies sometimes. Just which is yeah. bizarre because he has made that argument. Himself. I know he just he just did, I think he realized I was a Marxist and didn't like me. Oh, like yeah, I, I mean he, uh, Bob Black's wild. me. <laughs> he unfriended me recently for posting a Chomsky video, <laughs> and which I'm not a big Chomsky fan. So, yeah, that's uh, for someone who's always talking about you know pluralism and whatnot. It's real thin um, how yeah. easy to piss some of these people off. But uh, to get back, you know, to get out of uh, left gossip, I, I think one of the things that's hard to remember about the anarchist post left um, is that. It really wasn't, in all cases, a turn to, you know, I mean, some you might argue that some forms of primitivism are, re- I mean, even Derek Jensen would probably, I mean, excuse me, um, even, I was just thinking about who I would argue about this for, yeah. but even like uh, John Saracen would argue that some forms of primitivism took a turn towards the reactionary, um, you know, Jensen at one level, and then at the extreme level, you have like the most radical ends of things like Atasha. Um, yeah, which I, I was kind of going to say the ITS, so right, in Mexico, sure. right. Um, also, I I don't know why I said three. The insurrectionary anarchists, I think, pretty much considered themselves post left until uh, about ten years ago, mm-hmm. and then there's you know my my uh, friend Aragorn, who's no longer with us, was also a, a central figure in all that with Anarchy Magazine and. Later, Little Black Card and all these other projects, Anarchist News. Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, that world has been shaped by a very situationist oriented uh, concept of anarchism. Big, a big reason why is, is the punk rock connection, because uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, the guy who put the sex pistols together together Malcolm McLaren. Uh, yes. Yeah. He was, uh, earlier before he opened up that shop sex. Uh, he was part of a group called Kings mob and <laughs> Kings mob were a post situ, uh, group. So there's the beginning of punk rock was a, in some ways a situationist, uh, there's a, a good, fairly popular book on this. It was popular when I was in college, so it might be hard to get now. But, um, but it was a good introduction to the 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 weird way that pop that that pop culture and these political movements actually interacted, both left and right. Um, going back again to Dadaism, and that's Lipstick Traces by Grell Marcus, um, which is a great book about the relationship of punk to both communism and fascism because the art movements that it comes out of have relationships to both communism and fascism. And that, yeah, you have someone like McLaren who's a total grifter, but also did have this political background, um, you know, um, and we all know that it's almost impossible to keep grifters out of any political movement, but, um, but there is this real relationship there that's lost in 
you know, um, a lot of the commercialization of a lot of this music um, and a lot of the aesthetics around it. Um, and I think that's I think that's interesting because I, I also think you did kind of see that a little bit in these debates uh, in the anarchist scene in the 90s, because, um, you know, I, I talk about this a lot lately, but I, I mentioned, you know, that my infrared into this was actually you know, around the anti-globalization movement, which was a mixture of liberal anarchist and, in my case, paleo-conservative stuff where I picked the wrong side eventually. Um, and when you say liberal anarchist, you mean like... I mean, I mean like liberal anarchist. slash anarchist, but I, oh. I, I would say like... But there were people who overlap both milieus, like Chomsky, like yeah. our, oh, to yeah. some degree, Michael Albert and Z-Mag. Right? Mm -hmm. it, it was well, very yeah. hard sometimes to tell when they were being an anarchist and when they were just being Democrats, like, mm -hmm. um, because yes, they had a radical theory about how society would work, but it was like so far removed from what they were immediately advocating that it just didn't really matter. So yeah. Um, yeah. I like back when, uh, I used to take Bosch cars and car a little bit more seriously. Um, I probably shouldn't say that, but I'm going to leave it in. Um, I remember when he was working for the Senate magazine and wrote about this type of person, like the Naomi Klein person who is like, will throw anarchist forays out, but also social democratic forays out. And then like Keynesian forays out and then like Marxist forays out and not really seem to mean any of them, yeah. you know? Um, so there's a lot of that. Um, and but I remember at the time, if you got into like the right circles, if you didn't get sucked into international answer and that weirdness, and you didn't get sucked into what I got sucked into, the other thing that you could watch was like the Murray Bookchin Bob Black debates. Yep. Um, which were fascinating because I remember reading them and like feeling like the what, both sides were kind of right about the other one, like. <laughs> and that was part of a larger. It was called the red versus green debates in general, right. which, you know, was almost like a, a East Coast, West Coast thing as well, because, you know, NEFAC was your poster child for platformist anarchism and the West Coast definitely had nothing like that. Uh, there were some organizations that even I was part of, but I come out of that time period, too, which. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a, a weird time period, but I, I have to admit, these days with internet leftism, I sometimes get nostalgic for it. Um, even though I realize nostalgia is toxic and stupid. But it's just, it's it's like, oh, well, it, I felt like the debates were at least flesh out and I don't know. I mean, like, if you read the Bob Black, uh, Murray Bookchin debates, they they comprise 800-page books. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it, they, they produce a huge amount of of substantive material about what was going on, even if I don't really agree with either one of them. And, yeah. um, and I think this is also true for a lot of these, like a lot of these polemics that we read now as mostly literature or not high theory were, were kind of internecine debates. But the thing about existentialism is why we talk about structuralism, post-structuralism. It is very much rooted in the French Academy. Um, and, and the kind of expansion of the French Academy to include kind of like in the United States, but in, in some ways ended up being more radical people who were traditionally shut out of places like the Sorbonne. Like that turn is, I don't think we, we forget about that. Cause we think about like um, what Pierre Bourdieu says about Bourdieu, not Aline Badu, keep your French people separate. Uh, yeah. This is for my audience, not for you, Jared, but um, oh. um but what Bourdieu said about like the way, you know, social competition was used with, with high and same verbiage and stuff amongst these post-structuralists. But the thing to remember is even when someone is, is someone I dislike as much as Derrida, right? Um, they were from groups that were traditionally excluded from the French Academy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's also true of, of Camus. It's less true of Sartre. Um, it's right. true. He yeah. Go ahead. He, he was definitely part of the academy till he left it, but right. And then most of his career was outside of it, but he had that training and that background. He taught psychology courses before he developed his existentialism, and um, 
just as a side note. But yeah, very academic. Uh, and also at a weird time period because it's right after World War II. And well, yeah, uh, a little bit during too. But that in France, anarchism was hardly visible uh, during that whole period, which is another weird, like, did that tendency towards like an anti-authoritarian perspective get replaced by existentialism for that time? And then anarchism came back. Like, I think something might have happened there. Daniel Gurin, who I think you would like because he like Wayne Price, wrote for mm -hmm. Modern Times. Uh, I know Dan I know Daniel Gurin's work, and yes, like you you know you know, but you already pinned the anarchist that I like versus the anarchist that I don't. I mean, it, it um, of course, all the anarchists I like are highly are highly <laughs> concessionary to Marxism, but yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's interesting to um. To look at this debate, because I will say, I, I've encouraged people, for example, when they want to read State and Revolution, um, or, you know, that text by Lenin, or, or something like that, to go back and read um, uh, Wayne Price's breakdown of the different of the different class theories of the state, and, uh, and what was actually at stake with particularly some of these groups of, of anarchists versus, you know, in dialogue and competition and disagreement and agreement sometimes with Marxists um, mm -hmm. versus like the Marxist you meet who got into it from crime thinker, who got into it from, and from the popular version of crime think too, or who got into it from uh, Chomsky or Nathan Robinson or any of those people like the, we like to, you know, the people we all kind of like that even anarchists like the crap on who are like, you know, they discover their morality and confuse it for politics. Um, um, I, I do think that even if you come out a, a fairly orthodox Marxist, you actually do and should know the actual debates from these historical tendencies versus the crap you see on the internet now. Um, I, we both agree on that. I mean, I'm, <laughs> I guess I'm a little sympathetic towards Marxism, but uh, I know I've definitely been way more interested in reading Marxist material than some of the crappy anarchist stuff I see all the time. It's just, there's, it's bad. I mean, there's just a lack of interest in the, in the history and the history of the ideas. That's terrifying. Well, it's interesting to me that, like I, I told you off air that a lot of Marxists come to crypto Lasallian positions about the law being above class or the state being above class. Sometimes I'll have justifications based off something Lenin said specifically about the specific, you know, state condition in like night in like 1918 about class competition leading to something like a, a state that is above, uh, the class, but that's also contextually specific to a specific time period and a specific place not generalizable to all capitalist states after 1918. Um, and so when I hear, when I hear uh, people put into Marx's mouth, like that, not, you know, that we need that, you know, maintaining the state apparatus is super important. I'm just like, you're not, you're not even really a Marxist, like on a fundamental level, you're kind of not. And I know that in, in a way we shouldn't be policing who's really what, I mean, like that's somewhat useless actually uh, as a sectarian matter, but you do need to understand that like Marx's concessions towards, uh, towards the state were not that um, you would have a state forever or even that long um, because a state with a standing army and a professional apparatus implies a class. Right. Like, which is, was kind of Bakunin. Well, there's a little more to Bakunin's critique, but that was part of it. Right. Well, that Marx but, never, mm -hmm. he never got to finish his work on the state. So there's yeah. something unfortunate there. He gave up on it. I mean, like there's the whole, like, uh, you know, capital was supposed to be an entire like um, 
analysis of bourgeois society and then like basically what marx learned is just you know trying to understand the part uh, not even all of the base like uh, people misunderstand like misunderstand political economy when they forget that relations of production even in the the kind of vulgar metaphor of base and superstructure relations of production are in the base um which is not purely abstractly economic in the way that like capital is even though capital is about the development of a kind of relations of production as implied by classical political economy um but i mean Marx wrote that, then wrote, which he only published one of, wrote, what? Okay. If we include theories of surplus value in all three volumes of that, six volumes just to deal with the basics of bourgeois economy. So, and he never finished most of it. And he was also never completely comfortable on political stuff, honestly. I mean, and I say this, like, when he would do polemics, on uh contemporary politics um for the newspaper he would often actually ask Ingalls to flesh out the right. the political sections yeah um, it seems like angles actually a lot of the things anarchists don't like about marx are uh from angles's pen uh, yeah but but to, to uh to, to salvage Ingalls a little bit um Ingalls did insist on stuff like socialization and nationalization aren't the same thing and like was really mad at the Erfurt program for not understanding this. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, our Altusarian is screaming, but, uh, no, we'll, we'll, uh, in the, in the comment section, but we'll have to do that later. Um, <laughs> um, I know who, I know what these people's tendencies are. So, um, uh, one thing I would say is, uh, is that um, <sighs> the idea uh, one, one of the things I would say that, that I think is interesting about this existentialist stuff though is that it actually does you actually do work out that you think it does have immediate for lack of a better term, policy implications for Marxist and anarchists, if you were to actually try to apply it now, would you like to talk about what that would mean? Particularly when Marxist and anarchist and the broader left seems very lost in the post Trump era. I mean, people will, will deny this, but if you watch, I mean, you just have to watch Twitter or, or go to a DSA meeting or anything. And everyone seems completely lost as to what to do now. Well, so, I mean, that that type of thinking I'm developing really comes from two different directions. One is that if you're going to do a, a social uh, ontology that comes out of Sark, mm -hmm. really like, so he's got this theory of, uh, he calls it the practico inert. And what he means by this is that what is the result of the way that uh, human beings interacting with the world produces uh, mm -hmm. like so you know kind of like the way that labor laboring on materials you know produces a product sart had a more of a uh expanded idea of just any type of activity that was uh di directed at the interaction with the material world for lack of a better term produces mm -hmm. uh what he called the world as practico inert, an inert world that is still shaped by consciousness. And this is sort of his dialectic. And he uses this to explain how we have like, uh, you know, something like language or how we have various institutions. But to me, it seems pretty obvious that one of the things that human beings produce uh, in their practical activity our legal systems mm -hmm. and it seems like that's the big disconnect between a lot of contemporary socialists and uh what what might be thought of as uh an existentialist understanding of how history develops so laws come to be written down embodiments of conscious intentional activity and so 
uh, whether or not you're an anarchist, there's still something about constitutional constitution making or law making that is a creative practice uh, that that uh, requires the freedom of the imagination and action to carry out. So, and it also, you know, it, for, for some Marxists, you know, materialism is everything and they mm. really want to analyze, uh, you know, uh, factors of production and things like that. But, and, but, but yeah. materialism is understood pro largely as factors of production and, and by, li and by limiting it, um, to, to pure production capacity, which, which is, which is a critique that I take from anarchists that I think is actually fair. Um, one that I also think, uh, um, that there are hints that Marx did see the problem there. Like the, the, the like, for example, including relations in production, uh, of production, which are, which are largely actually legal categories, historically speaking. Right. Um, exactly. This is exactly the thing. <laughs> um, in, in the base of society, uh, except for in capital. Like that's, you know, and a lot, both, both anarchist existentialist and neo chartalist all push back on that. Um, saying that if we don't, you know, if you don't look at law, you don't really understand what's going on. Neo chartalists kind of have a, a I'm not going to say they have a no class view of the law, but they do kind of see the laws above class relations, which I think is absurd, but yeah, that's absurd. Um, some of them will kind of say something, you know, about how the law exists in a class context, but they treat the law as if it, if it, it is, it is not a manifestation of power, but like a creation of community. Um, even when you go into the implications of their monetary theory being like, yeah, people take money cause you make them because you have, because you provided credit or had debts and you did that at gunpoint or, or sure. spear point at the case may be <laughs> like, um, so, but, I mean, I think, I don't know. There's just a lack of, again, it comes back to not knowing history. A lot of the time, like if you look at the history of the continental, uh, sorry, if you look at the colonial period of the United States, you see like how legal systems were forming in the different colonies and, uh, what class, was creating them and the interaction between, you know, the British appointed governors and sort of like these assemblies that were uh, uh, formed to, to basically govern themselves. Right. And, I mean, and they also have, I mean, just as a side note, what, what the neo chartalists and MMTers focus on is the fact that these classes had like, um, th they did not have commodity money actually a lot of times in the, in the, in, in the uh, in the colonial period, a lot of it was fiat currency, and then would be transferred in the commodity money. And they would like destroy certain amounts of it to keep the like wear it off inflation, et cetera, and so forth. But they, again, they often treat this as value neutral or as like just a policy decision with no power implications whatsoever, which to me is nutsoid. Like it's just yeah. like no, they were doing that for a reason. There's also a reason why you had to have property to like vote. Like, you know, well, it's all tied yeah, together. No, exactly. Like, no, like conscription, voting, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, the the original suffrage movement was just a movement for every man to vote. It wasn't right. even, a, yeah, it was, it was just to get rid of the property uh, standard. But, yeah, I mean, even beyond that, though, yes, it comes out of a certain class, but law is also ultimately rooted in philosophy. Mm. So when you start changing some of your fundamental assumptions about human society and uh, uh, responsibility and, and all these uh, basic questions that come up in existentialism, you have to wind up uh, eventually changing the way you apply those assumptions to conflict resolution or property in general as a question on uh, things like that. So what that application tends to look like is writing something down and, and what that written down thing tends to be called is policy. 
Right. So, so you you made the argument that anarchist, and I and I, guess, I guess you'd also extend that to Marxist, um, even if they're totally abstentionist, like if even if they don't believe in in participating in electoral politics whatsoever, they would still have to deal with policy. Right. Exactly. Like if you, uh, I make the argument that you know the uh, democratic uh, governing of the commons is still basically a, a policy creating act. Right. I mean, like if you think about even into the furthest reaches of not just between like Trotskyism, Stalinism, social democracy, but even in like, say, left com land, which I did a primer on uh, with someone else a couple weeks ago, um, the divisions between councilism, um, confederated syndicalism and organic centralism, whatever that is, um, are, are, are huge policy differences on how you administer uh, what they would all claim to be a nation stateless society. Right. right. Well, okay. And that, and even to say the term nation state opens up this whole world of what these uh, socialist thinkers were dealing with at, at the 19th century, uh, century 19th, early it, 20th century. Yeah. Yeah. What all the nation states were forming. It wasn't like that, that shit existed yet. So yeah, I mean, they the only- were watching like the legal and military, uh, uh, regime, uh, come into being based on John Locke and Rousseau and like seeing why these bourgeois thinkers would ultimately wind up screwing over the, the class of laborers that were becoming the proletariat. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it's interesting to watch John Locke. I mean, cause I have some socialist friends of mine who really want to defend Locke and Provisos, but then I'm always like, I don't believe he ever believed any of that. Like one, he wrote the South Carolina, um, or at least helped co-write the South Carolina colonial charter, which has slavery in it. Um, so self-ownership seems hard to square with that. I know he's got an, I know he does have an out and I know what the out is, but it just seems unserious. And B, he literally watched the enclosure, so he can't claim that the peasants they're enclosing from want using and improving the land. But he exists during a time period in which that is happening. So unlike, you know, libertarian idiots who exist when this is in the deep past are, you know, seemingly in the deep past. It's not in the United States, but, but you know, they'll pretend it is. Um, uh, it's a live question for John Locke, right? Um and it's one where he's con- he's actually creating a myth that is in direct contradiction to what is happening in his lifetime. Um, well, isn't that true for Adam Smith as well? Wasn't he, or was that just how his thinking was used? Uh, that's how his justify? thinking was used. Like like the the thing about Smith, Smith's primary concern in in terms of class war uh, was to get rid of the rentier class, which was like the last vestiges of, of the feud, uh, uh, of feudal rents. Right. Okay. Sure. Um, right. And so his his concern for like mercantilism is actually a concern for people who he feels truly parasite off the land because they literally just have the land by legal fiat, um, mm-hmm. and you serve them. Like, and so that's his concern. Um, I I I tend to be somewhat sympathetic to the to the Smith as more radical than we give him credit for. Uh, okay. Reading. Um, However, I also think um, that all, th- they're just bourgeois myths in 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 um, Smith because Smith thinks, for example, that you can keep pol- that you can keep uh, political administration and economic administration separate. Like like his laissez faire is not only should government not affect um. Uh, the market, but also it's supposed to go in the other direction too. The market's right. not supposed to affect the government. And sure. you think about like, how the hell would that work? Because you're also assuming that taxes are funding this. Like there's some sort of taxation, even if it's tariffs are funding this, you know, <laughs> like, so that, that that's kind of a non-starter. So you have similar contradictions, but to me, it's not as blatant as like the enclosures, uh, 
you know, justify property. Oh, let's just say that use justifies property and ignore the fact that the people we're taking this from were using the land. So, like, yeah, um, yeah. So, I think so, you know, all so to draw that back in, you know, I think existentialism definitely, you know, uh, throws a wrench into these um, naturalistic arguments about property. Uh, which you know, which would be natural law, natural rights, the social contract, all that stuff. How do right. you don't get that? What if existence precedes essence, right? Right. So, so the, I mean, the existential intervention it does just say like all like natural law is horseshit, basically. Yeah. Like, right. <laughs> like, um, and it's interesting to me what you've seen with liberals. Okay, uh, just as a side note. A lot of liberals still believe in this Lockean tradition, but I actually think the conservative critique, the natural law conservative critique, is actually somewhat fair from their own framework. Most of them justify this upon utilitarian nor norms or human rights norms, which becomes a substitute for natural law. Um, but they what, can't. Wait. Modern, like modern liberals, still pull from yeah. this Lockean proviso, right? Okay. They still believe in the social contract. They still, they still largely believe in self ownership. They still largely kind of only see class as a, um, is epiphenomenal to society, not as phenomenal. Uh, and so, you know, right. Um, so it's something that's unfortunate and but and but maybe we can tweak it away. It's not it's not based on the basic functioning of how we socially reproduce ourselves, right? Um but they don't have they don't believe in God, so they can't appeal to natural law. <laughs> like right. so at least they, it's not a part of their their like it it's not really a part of their ideology, even though they're gonna they're going to make the claim when running for office or something. Right. Or, or, well, are they do on stuff like human rights, but they can't actually, de like, they defend human rights largely actually on, on natural law grounds without saying so, but, but can't actually, like, they, it's actually, it's like, it's, it usually becomes circular. Uh, human rights are good because they are human rights. And then you're like, yeah. well, Okay, if I base this off of inalienability, right? Like human rights are inalienable. Like you can't, they, they're obvious and, and uh, they're natural, right? But most of you believe that in some degree, even though you clearly don't. Uh, um, so, what, you know, why do you need to protect them by law if those two conditions are true without a theological justification? And the condition, the, the question just becomes basically because, or they'll try to do a utilitarian justification of it, right. which, which upon any deep consideration, totally falls apart. Like it's just like, yeah, the, the, there's no way to mathematically calculate that in any meaningful sense. You know, it's just not, it's not a meaningful assertion. Um, so I think existentialism is radical in that and. Most people who most people don't think about the radicalness because even if they're religious, they they pretty much assume that we do not have like I don't know anyone who's not a diehard traditionalist Catholic who really truly believes in natural law. Well, well, when did when did the uh, uh, Christians even begin to accept that as an argument? Like this would be. Well, I guess they accepted it with the rev the bourgeois revolutions, right? Right, right. It's a bourgeois revolution argument, right? Because prior to that, I mean, th there is the beginnings of it in an Aquinian, like, late medieval thinking. But that's really late medieval thinking. It's not medieval thinking. And it's also the beginnings of it. And Aquinas more or less abandons it. Like the whole the the whole natural law argument um, there is that you know God created a reasonable universe, um, yeah, uh, and science yeah. is how you discover the the reason behind right, the, yeah, w which he got from actually late late Islamic thinkers in in the um, one of the Islamic reformations, right? So, um, which was which is an Islamic reading of Aristotle, 
not to just put the intellectual history gloss on it. I, I'm still a Marxist. I think the fact that this is coming up at the beginning of nation states in France and England is kind of important and Absolutely. the end of the Crusades. Like, so like I would still say that doesn't get you out of the, oh, this is proto-bourgeois because it is still proto-bourgeois. Like, so this is where you can see the kind of lineage between the old world and the new, right? And, and by- I think- <laughs> I, I, this is uh, not exactly following from what you said, but it is um, on, on the topic. Mm -hmm. The national question is, is what, what it used to be called, the question of nationalism. Uh, we're seeing that come back with a fury, and yeah. I don't think the left knows how to handle it at all. I would, I, to, to pick up on this in the modern context, I think you're absolutely correct. Partially, and I, I would say partially because historically speaking, we have had a double answer to it. Internationalism yeah. has been about using nationalism to break apart empires, but then under yes. the assumption that the nationalist would, with relative self-autonomy, come together to form non-state polities or arbitrary post-state polities they, or... Mm -hmm. Like the Western uh, assumption was that by by encouraging nationalist groups, they would also, uh, along with their nationalism, adopt liberal democracy and republican values, which right. those things did not go together necessarily. They well, I was about to say they didn't even necessarily go together at the time they were doing it. So like. Right. Like you think about Italian nationalism only really succeeds when they drop the liberal part and yeah. may, and, and concede it. Um, and I would also say part of this is the entire Western culture's over focus on England and France. Um, to, to bring this up in the context of like right now, I had a I was. I don't normally talk about my job, but I'm going to because this is this is a story that came up last week. I had a teacher who came to me and was like, hey, Varn, would you say that America is the first country based off on idea instead of based off nationhood? Because, you know, they're the French and the Germans and the whatever. And I'm like, well, no, I wouldn't actually say that at all because Germany didn't even exist yet. Um uh, and also German culture, the unification of German culture itself is a product of the nationalization process yeah. that washed out the difference between the Frisians and uh, yeah, uh, the, the Frisians and the Tyrolians and the Prussians and the Bavarians and in certain er and the Saxons, et cetera, et cetera. And in certain right. areas, those regionalisms, which are also kind of micro-nationalism, still yes. exist to this day. They right. have never been fully purged. Including um, here. Including, right. And, and, you know. The South is the obvious one, but I think it's true. Like, if you really study, I totally, I, I don't buy the reasoning behind the 15 nations, you know, thesis in the United States. Okay. Which, are, which is largely ethnic. But I do, like, in, in a way that's a little icky when you think about some of the racial implications of it. But Are you um, talking about, like, Colin Woodard? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. But I do think there's a truth to the fact that that um, re historical differences between peoples, even between white peoples, quote-unquote, um, that are even lost on the people there now that like, they don't remember, yes. like we don't remember that, Oh, we were Scotch Irish and new Englanders were English and we hated them. Um, for the most part. Well, that's to me, that is what the whiteness, uh, project was know, designed to do was to get rid yeah. of those like interregional tensions, but it doesn't do it completely. <laughs> Um, no. and, and anyone who travels extensively and lives anywhere in the U.S. for a couple of times will tell you, no, it really doesn't. Like, I mean, yeah, yeah, I live in an extreme example of it. I moved from the South to Pennsylvania to Ohio to to lived abroad for ten years, and then moved to Mormonlandia, right? But like, which uh, I am also from. from you're Mormon from Land. Mormonlandia, right? <laughs> Not Utah, but I'm from a, a suburb in Gilbert which is a Mormon founded. Uh, so, so greater Mormonlandia. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> um, so, so, so yeah, I mean, and those distinctions are really different and there, there are ways in which like, I think this is underappreciated by Americans. It's underappreciated by American left. It's underappreciated by American liberal press. It's kind of even underappreciated by American conservatives, although they, they, they actually do seem to be the one group that occasionally is able to make hay of it. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. Um, so, well, so the, right. I, you know, that, that has been the official project, you know, to, to, uh, to get rid of the old world mindset of that kind of a regionalism. Someone in the chat is bringing up Colin Woodard, uh, the thesis excluding African-Americans. He does actually, uh, at one point talk about, uh, why that wasn't brought into his major work and he has done other work on that on yeah. the various cultural geography uh, he th he basically i mean the, the, the long and short of it is he basically thinks the white part of the south and the black part of the south were significantly enough different cultures to you would have to map them separately uh something that i think is actually kind of a contentious claim because i i i am one of the believers that like um southern culture and and african uh and post post slave african african american culture um highly overlaps in ways that are separate because of segregation and jim crow and a variety of other reasons but can't really be separated like for example that it was a mutually informed cultural exchange like words like y'all come from like west uh like West England down, down through the Scotch Irish area and into black dialect. Whereas there's also black, uh, like African dialectical patterns that show up in Southern English that, that don't show up anywhere else in, in U S English. Um, I always used to laugh when people would say obonics was another language. Remember people remember the nineties obonics category and so classifying nice. it as another language was actually an attempt to get money. No one actually really believed it by the way. Um, that's in the, also the linguistic studies on, dialects found like like tons of different dialects it's not just one no there's there's dialect. there there's several different black dialects because you know segregation was all of throughout the country right. and um also different african groups settled in different areas um even arbitrarily um and uh I, for, what I was always laugh about that is when people would say well white kids can't pass an abonics test and I was like Unless they're from the deep south, right? Which, uh, and which, which I definitely, I definitely understood everything that was said. I was like, yeah, totally. Like, I, I, like, except for three phrases, I talk the same way when, you know, when I'm at home. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's an interesting, um, a thing to look at. I think Marxists tend to. I even think they do this with class, frankly, even within the working class, they tend to take a, a, a fundamental division, which is absolutely true and probably the primary dividing division, but then not look at any other divisions because it's somewhat inconvenient, which is also why I think why they don't always understand things like class aspirational battles or intersection, like intersection. I, I can't even say the word intersectional anymore because it's used in a different way now, but the battles between different sections of the economy that are like almost permanent, uh, even amongst workers um, and stuff like that. It's, it's because like, in some ways we don't want to deal with sociology because it's somewhat inconvenient. Well, here's um, an interesting, like, uh, like way to talk about that problem is what, how much work, from Marxists have been has been done about anti-communism in in the United States. It's like probably one of the largest uh, uh, forces in shaping a the political landscape in the United States has been anti-communism for right. a century. And, and like Marxists come. complain about it, but they don't actually do that much deep analysis of it, other than saying it was bad and it was a right. thing. Right. Um, and also, I mean, I've only read one one Marxist who actually, and and like I said, many people consider Christopher Lash a right wing Marxist, um, if a Marxist at all. But Christopher Lash's primary concern um, in his early period, so before culture of narcissism, is liberal and left response to the Russian Revolution and why anti communism came so easily 
um, to the United States. Like, I'll have to read that. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm, I'm very interested in that, that history. Like his first his first book is a dissertation that even I didn't think was that important until I started reading it, and it's American Liberals in the Russian Revolution. That's what he started writing about. Mm-hmm. Um, then he started writing about why the socialist and populist movement were were sucked into progressivism as, as revitalization projects of bourgeois liberalism um, from specific well, subclass. Do you mean when you say that? Are you talking about like urban planning? No, I'm I'm talking about like well, yeah, urban planning, but also like like the end of even promoting stuff like the myth of entrepreneurial capital, which really begins with Teddy Roosevelt. Like, um, and so like he says that like urban planning, um, redistributed policies, social goods, um, these are all like recuperated by progressives from the populist and socialist and anarchist movements. Yeah. Um, but they're not, they're done so in ways that are conducive towards Fordist capital. And then later on in the end of his life, he's like, and Fordism is a bridge into neoliberalism actually. You know, like, so it's, it's, it's an interesting book. I don't agree. I mean, I don't agree with all his conclusions actually. And I'm writing a book on him. So I talk about him all the time, but yeah, it's, I, I hear but, you bring him up all the time, but, uh, well, I bring, also bring him up because of pe- his fans, like the fans of Sartre, um, are often, they often don't really understand what he's doing. Like they read the hits, um, which, which sound very self-helpy. You know, like culture of narcissism, people hit, hit, they even in the title, they hit on the narcissism part and not the culture of, or they think it's like a voluntaristic problem. Like, oh, we all became narcissists because we're all self-obsessed because we're assholes. And like the actual thesis of the book is like, no, capitalism has, has restricted social space to the point that there's no community space for you to invest in. So you don't really have any choice but to invest your identity into yourself. And thus, like... I- Totally, I talk about that all the time. Isn't that sort of a DeBoard kind of atomized? Yeah, DeBoard. Thing? I think a whole lot of people in the '50s started seeing this, like okay, and, well, and, the lonely crowd, all that stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, except that that like DeBoard, Lash is coming at it from a specifically um, socialist. And I think at that point he admits to being a Marxist early on. He's cagey about it because it's still the height of the cold war or the end of the cold war in the early sixties. So like, um, but it, you know, he's ne- he never hides that he's a socialist and he speak like he, he, you don't find many critiques of Marx. You do find critiques of the USSR, um, in, um, in lash particularly after the 40 in the 30s and 40s so during like the high period of stalinism but you don't find uh critiques of marx and you also interestingly enough lash thinks that the the, that the people who became um anti-communist marxist or anti-communist leftists were traitors even though he doesn't like support he doesn't think the the ussr was a you know probably a properly speaking functional marxist society and like he, he's not writing about america right or is he no he's only writing about america he doesn't deal oh. with it what he what he deals with is the american intervention like so for example the congress on cold war freedom where you took a bunch of marxists from the 30s and 40s and sent them on which which he suspected was cia money but couldn't prove but now we've actually proven was right. oss and cia money um to europe to do anti-communist work under the guise of liberalism um right and as art art movements right yeah as as art movements yeah yeah. and they were that he basically accuses them of selling out um to the state um for anti-communist you know for 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 just crass anti-communist reasons and Mm -hmm. you know there are some historians who've talked about this in the last 20 years but like he wrote this in the '60s, so That's, like it, it's only ten years in the past when he's writing it, and, and it's kind of wild that this is not remembered. What everyone remembers is his like, you know, culture of narcissism post, or, or his last book, you know, um, which was a book that his frankly conservative daughter uh, curated with him, and there's debates over how much she 
no one thinks that she wrote it like there are, it's even a case like with uh with like Nietzsche's sister where you have someone turning it reactionary but there is there is debates over whether or not he actually wanted it published it in the state it was in it was published um posthumously and um i have several interviews with people who knew him and said he was not happy with the state of the manuscript and probably didn't want to see it in print um and that's the that's the that's the manuscript that all the populists go to, right? Um, not his early stuff where he explicitly critiques populism. So it's it's interesting because I actually do see a parallel with Sartre, and I also think it's interesting how these ideas are convergent. Like, 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 yeah, actually, yeah, Lash was actually conversant in the Frankfurt School and in existentialism, and he even references Foucault. He doesn't write like a post-structuralist or a post-modernist, so people don't realize it because he just writes normally. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Like he's not using neoliberalism, um, or like neo. Not he uses neoliberalism actually, but he's not using a lot of neolis neolisms. Excuse me, let me get say things correctly to to make his point. Um, I mean, we've kind of diverted off topic, but I think your point about law is well taken, and I wish more Marxists took it seriously. Right, but and it goes back to what you're what you were basically saying is that you know there's an emphasis uh, on uh, there's so much of an emphasis on certain parts of the. Well, materialism is taken to mean economics as somehow the economics don't involve social relations and social relations are seen as epiphenomenal or superstructural, which one, um, the base superstructure actually is a feedback loop metaphor. So even, even that reading of the most vulgar forms is still a misreading, but two relations of production are part of the base. And so when I say that people are like, well, you don't understand Marx. And I'm like, no, it's relations of production are part of the base. Otherwise what you'd be saying is like, when people say shit like feudal society was classless, it, it just had caste. And I'm like, no, it's not. Marx doesn't believe that. Like Marx does not say that the history of all society is, is the history of class conflict cannot be true. If you, if class is only a term that applies to capitalism. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how I always thought that the base superstructure thing was uh, uh, a feedback system because isn't that the whole factory system is sort of like how Marx or at least Marxists explain the rise of the class consciousness. Right. right. The factory system brings together the, uh, all these people and into, uh, into and, and social you have to relations. And you need institutions and stuff to re to reaffirm those social relations. They're not automatic. That's a difference between Marxism and certain forms of, uh, of, of, Anarchism, although, again, anarchism is, I also, I get really mad at Marxist about this. Anarchism is much harder to generalize about because it's more than one theory and some of which are radically opposed to each other. So, yeah, well, and I, I don't think many people understand Prudhomme, mm. uh, including anarchists and uh, especially that speak English. One of the big reasons is the guy wrote like 50 volumes uh, he and what's available in English is like I don't know three books <laughs> that cover like the beginning of his career, um, and then you know the poverty of philosophy is not a, a, a good faith argument against Proudhon. Would you like to go into that a little bit? Well, I'm so. I'm, this isn't uh, fresh on my mind, but from what I understand, you know, a lot of Marxist uh, concepts about um, the way that collective, uh, the way that surplus is created in labor mm. and instead of that value being distributed back to the workers, the value of the surplus is distributed among the owners. It's a Prudhonian argument, but... Um, from what I understand is that uh, in the poverty of philosophy, Marx basically is attacking Proudhon for not understanding that, which which he did or something along those lines. There's a lot of cases of straw manning Proudhon or just. 
Well, I mean, one thing I will say about 18th and 19th century polemics is they're almost all straw men. Like, yeah. like um, it's it, it's kind of frustrating, actually, because we take these at face value a lot of the time. And um, if you actually try to reconcile them, even what Marx did and who, who like, Marx was talking to and what compromises they made, it doesn't make a lot of sense if you if you don't tone it down. Um, in your own mind, um, you know, uh, that said, I mean, um, I mean, for example, like, um, Marx was totally willing to work with Prudonis in the international, um, yes, exactly. for a long time. I mean, he does yeah. have a point where he doesn't, he thinks it's not youthful anymore, but, um, but it's, it, it's, uh, it's really the bakutinist that really pisses him off. Right. Yeah. Um, and- and people, even, you know, and then Bakunin's another topic, which, you know, people don't realize how into Hegel Bakunin was. Yeah. You know, Marx, the copy of uh, Hegel's works that Marx read was given to him by Bakunin. This is like how crazy the the actual lives of these early socialists are. Well, I mean, like, yeah. And- you think about the fact that, like, uh, Bakunin, Wagner... And uh, arch reactionary racist nationalists and Ingalls are all like near each other in 1848, like literally taking up arms. And, and actually, it's something that Bakuna would throw at Marx is Marx is the only one of those individuals who was not right in um, yeah. the health to fight and didn't. So right. Um, but yeah, I think this is this is good stuff. The, the history of this goes in, into like we talked about. This this kind of misunderstanding of partial understanding, it I think super informs our misunderstandings about the 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 post war years too. I mean we're 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 back in deep socialist history now, but um, w- when you look at the existentialist post structuralist debates, as we said, a lot of this is lost, and they often didn't seem to understand each other, um, mm-hmm. or they were deliberately misrepresenting each other's arguments. Um, uh, there is a sense also in th- that you see this move from polemics into the academy, which is true across the board, um, and then back out from the academy, back out into... Like, the, the thing is, if you say, oh, it's just academic Marxism, like some Trotskyists will occasionally do, that's also not fair, because these people were interacting with real communist parties, and they had effect on real communist parties, um, too. So it's... Um, and you know, and anarchist groups, etc. So it wasn't, it was not also totally cloistered in the academy, particularly in a place like the Sorbonne, where like lectures were free to the public. Like sure, or you know, like they the Communist Party was so came out uh, on top of the Nazi invasion of France, mm-hmm. the occupation, you know, and they were highly revered for a long time because of that. Right, there was because a, they, they were the right a, side of the. Of the of of the popular front, so to speak. Right. Yeah, and they like it. It was. Uh, you really had to be a conservative to not be a con, be in some way for the PCF at that point. Right. You, yeah, you had to basically be a Vichy sympathizer. Like. Yeah. Yep. Uh, um, so just to kind of, cause we've been all over the place. So I'm going to like roadmap it for our, so we're going to wrap up here, but I'm going to roadmap it for our listeners. Um, you think that existentialism should be reconsidered that it's unpopularity is kind of a mixture of our associating association of it with the arts because of the beats and other people in the United States. Um, the fact that it kind of got lost out to the battle with pro-structuralism and we didn't talk about this, but I, I should have added it. Um, post-structuralists were brought to America by academic institutions in ways that that some of the existentialists were not. Um, mm-hmm. So, like, I don't think Sartre was ever given a full professorship at, like, Stanford, right? Like, or anything like that. And that was definitely true with some of the post-structuralists. Um, so that's another consideration um, that this actually does have policy implications and policy we need to define more broadly than just liberal electoralism. Like the way you administer communist society is effectively or any kind of post capitalist society to be super conclusive. If people don't like the C word um, 
is still would involve policy decisions. Like the administration of things and Marx does not get you out of policy. It might get you out of right. politics as classed politics, but it doesn't get you out of policy debates. Or um, out of re- you might be able to get rid of representation. Even, right. But you're still doing policy. Right. So policy is, is so policy is always with us. Um, and then other digressions were we need to understand the history of these movements more thoroughly um, than we do, which is like almost always my calling card is like, yeah, there's more to know um, that a lot of these debates are both incomplete because we study the polemics, but also because so much of it, even though it's in readily available languages that are commonly spoken, even in the United States, a fairly monolingual culture, um, it's not like people are asking people to translate stuff from Eritrean. Like this is French, right. um, uh, so or even Arabic. Um, so like, so we need more of these texts to be translated and understood, and we need to approach them in their own context. Um, anything else you'd like to add to my summary? No, <laughs> I mean that was that was a pretty uh, good summary there. Yeah, I just I, I I I try whenever I feel we're going all over the place and we haven't hit the like five hour mark or something crazy and I can't even begin to I try to summarize this up for my listeners um, to kind of get the big ideas. So I'd like to thank you, Jared. I think you're going to come back online because I think there's still a whole lot of stuff you write about that uh, we haven't really talked about yet. If uh, people want to find you, they can find you at Sla- Cyber Dandy and and uh, there's a news feed associated with that. It's like everything's dandy or yeah. What is it called? Uh, yeah. Cyberdandy.org. And then there's a link to a news feed on regularly just uh, putting whatever I'm interested in into. Um, and uh, you started like the rest of us fools. Uh, you moved to the tubes a couple of times. And uh, where's that at? Still working on it. It's still uh, what my ongoing uh, focus is going to be. I'm pretty much. Um, moving away from writing and just, I don't, I have not been happy with the anarchist uh, presence on, on various tubes. Oh, well, I I have no doubt. Like if you think Marxist or meta anarchist, you listen to old anarchists complain about new anarchists. It'll make you feel better. Um, (laughs) um, It's just like, Oh, I'm not the only person who complains about these people. Um, So uh, it's, I think that I think uh, people should check you out once you get that up and running and um, we'll probably have you back on in the future. Uh, probably will pick back up existentialism because I also think it's more intellectually interesting than interested that it's treated in high school in the United States. Um, even though I, I, you know, I, I have my critiques of Sartre and I mean, I, one thing I will say is I think, I think it, behaviorally Sartre does become somewhat of a dubious figure at times in, in his uh, history um, in ways that we do have to kind of deal with. Sure. Um, uh, but I would tell people if you're going to pick up stuff from team France, all right, um, please the mid fifties and sixties stuff it's probably a better use of your time than some of the eighties and nineties stuff. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's what I would say. Um, I like to thank you for coming on Jared. Uh, we will also release this as a podcast, but I'm going to edit a little bit um, before that's the case. Or, or my producer, Paul will, or we both will. Um, and so I'll tell you when that's up. And uh, I, I thank you for coming on. Thank you for your time. Cool. Thank you for having me. All right. Awesome. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. In broadcast.